Thank you very much, uh, Danilo. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. I uh, hope the connection is well functioning. Hope you can see and uh, hear me well enough. Yeah. So I will uh, I will share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, and so sorry because I I I haven't been very careful in how I prepare my my different uh, screen and uh, windows. So uh, I have different windows uh, with my uh, 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 the text and the slides. So, uh, well, it's kind of impractical, but I'm, I, I, I deal with it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, as, as uh, Danilo already told you, uh, 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 um, I give you a talk about the book that's uh, upcoming in Germany under the title Überfluss und Freiheit. It's a translation of Abondance et Liberté. It's only the second time I have the occasion to, to give a talk in Germany uh, about this book. So I'm very glad and especially glad to, uh, to uh, reconnect with the German academic and intellectual field after being very much estranged from it uh, uh, for a long time. So I will give you a, a, a the whole historical sketch that you'll find in the book. Uh, I want to focus on the more normative political outcomes of this historical, historiographical reflection. Uh, uh, so I focus on the main theoretical outcome of this research, which is the unmaking and remaking of social democracies, institutions and conceptual grounds to the experience of the environmental and in particular, climate crisis. But uh, first, I would like to show you this uh, 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 extract from a piece from a speech given by Emmanuel Macron in January. This happened in between uh, uh, the moment we, uh, I, I was supposed to give this talk, and now this is a speech he gave in, in late January about his energy policies, both as the president and as a candidate for the upcoming uh, uh, elections. So uh, uh, it's in French, I won't translate the, the whole quotation, but just summarizing to su summarize for you. So it's about uh, 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 the economy of energy or sobriety. So he says, the challenge is very well known. We have to be able to uh, degrow by 40% our energy consumption. It's a big challenge, but it's feasible. He says, and he describes how he he suggests to uh, uh, um, to, uh, uh, to be successful with this challenge, and his whole argument revolves around innovation, around the continued process of technological and scientific innovation that is, to him, supposed to guarantee that we both escape the climate crisis and reinforce and pursue the historical process of modernization. And the main reason why he, he develops this whole eco-modernist argument is given at the end of the quotation. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because it's the exact same at the subtitle of this talk. He ends up saying it's the, the last sentence, so, qui propose de produire moins m'expliquera comment à ce moment-là on pourra protéger plus. So, who's, who's suggesting to produce less will have to explain to me how then we'll be able to protect more. So, uh, 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 well, I don't think he was <laughs> aware of my <laughs> uh, 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 lecture <laughs> with you, but clearly uh, uh, we end up with the same dilemma between producing or maybe behind the idea of production, productivism and well, social welfare. So this is, I think, a good uh, starting point for uh, this lecture. And now I can move to uh, 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 well, my own uh, 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 thread of thinking. So one of the first puzzles I'll try to solve while working on the book is the following. Why has the ecological concern never really been understood as a social, as a deeply political issue before very recent years? So the reason is the following. On one side, 
we have environmentalists who try to overcome the, and, and escape the political by claiming that preserving nature is an overarching and neutral human interest. Classic American environmentalism, for example, and later the post-war universalist, internationalist, green humanitarianism, both promoted the same vision of a post-political species-wide consensus where science and matter of facts were substituted to political power struggles and, of course, class-based movements. On the other side, <clears throat> political thought, whether liberal or Marxist-oriented, mostly insi insisted that the political is the realm of intersubjective or interclass conflict that social norms and governmental regime are the product of collective autonomy. To borrow from Marx in this framework, freedom begins where necessity ends. And since ecology is considered a matter of necessity, it has nothing to do or it should have nothing to do in political debates. That is why the environment could only be a secondary contradiction of society at best. Maybe in some cases considered an elite concern or at worst, a complete betrayal of progressive politics by some kind of conservative naturalism. And here I refer to the, 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 the argument made by Marcel Gauchet in a paper that's, be, that's become very famous in France, uh, 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 Sous l'amour de la nature, la haine de l'homme, well, behind the love for nature, the hate, hate, uh, hate for humanity. Okay? So politics finds it, its very dignity by transcending the realm of material determinations, by opening the field of human freedom with the help of technology and science. So claiming that nature matters was massively considered and still is massively considered a return to primitive thought and a primitive condition, the bondage of nature. In this polar polarization, we are left with a green, what we could call a green depoliticization carried out by diplomats, naive scientists, millenarist thinkers, and moralists. And on the other side of this tragic divide lies the inability of social justice thinkers to incorporate the sense of limits, maybe the critique of growth, to the foundations of critical thought. This is what in the book I call the problem of incommensurability. The mainstream understanding of politics doesn't include ecological matters, so they are conceived as a flight out of politics. Um, obviously, uh, this is a problem for political philosophy, but also for the history of ideas, for historiography, because our reflexive historical consciousness is not adjusted to grasp the origins of the climate and biodiversity crisis. Well, I switched slide too early, sorry. <laughs> Uh, uh, our, uh, uh, our reflexive historical consciousness is not adjusted to locate all this within our political development. So I then realized that our understanding of the process of modernization had been deeply challenged by the history of science and technology, by social studies of science, by new anthropologies of modernity, for example, the scholar you mentioned, uh, Danilo, by environmental history in a very broad uh, meaning. And political social philosophy was still lagging behind because it was still centered on previous paradigms of modernization, focused on state building, on the development of civil society and its internal tensions, on class struggles, on the founding values of liberal democracies, etc. But not much was done to adjust our understanding of contemporary issues to the new fields of knowledge I mentioned above. To put it quickly, I think we need to a rewriting of, his, of the history of political ideas that locates the development of modern normative claims, first of all, freedom, property, sovereignty, within the emergence of new ecological standards and practices. First of all, the improvement, the idea of the improvement of land, of land the conquest of productivity by empire and coal. Because if we consider modern political thought only as a matter of state building, as a matter of secularization, as a matter of class struggle, we cannot grasp 
the deeply historical and political character of the climate crisis. We are condemned to understand it as an historical accident, as a purely external event. And I would add that reducing the ecological crisis to any one of these historical and political patterns, whether it is uh, 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 state building, secularization or class struggle, leads to misunderstandings and false solutions. So what I call in the book, the environmental history of political ideas is my attempt to build a new understanding of what we inherit from the past. My main concern was with the history usually built by advocates of the green movements, an history of techno-scientific destruction of the world, or an history of how aesthetic and, and moral qualities were attributed to nature, or, in this, or if you want romanticism, or an history of how the interconnectedness of all things was discovered by science. It's all usually a really poor historical reflexivity focused on these so-called origins of environmental consciousness and vastly disconnected from socioeconomic concerns. So there is a big difference between the history of environmental ideas, those ideas that are explicitly forged to address the ecological crisis, and the environmental history of ideas that focuses potentially on any given political ideas from the perspective of how it contains prescriptions about how to treat resources, territories, and knowledge about nature. So my idea is not to go back to the past and look for the roots of who we are as ecologists or environmentalists. It's not a list of the glorious uh, 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 forbearers of uh, environmental thoughts, but to go back to the past to understand how the set of concepts that defines modernity again, mostly freedom, sovereignty, property, how this set of concepts is shaped by environmental concerns like the control over space, the productivity of land, the relationship with non-agrarian societies, the distribution of the benefits of industry. And with this historical background, I hope the, cu the current crisis doesn't appear anymore as something beyond politics or something that betrays the democratic legacy. So. Let's now go back to the issue of conceiving the ecological question as a problematic higher to the labor, to the social question. I know it's difficult to translate because we use extensively in France, la question sociale. Uh, so in English would give you labor issue. Uh, it's usually translated as the labor issue. Um, <coughs> since, since the advent of industrial capitalism and even more with post-war welfare capitalism, collective emancipation is rooted in productivity. A strange but very interesting text by French philosopher Alexandre Kojev said this very explicitly in the 50s in a, an article on colonialism commissioned by Carl Schmitt. So I'm just summarizing the, the extract you have here on the slide. Henry Ford said, Kojev realized Marx's dream by offering a compromise between labor, productivity, and discipline and social reward in the form of consuming power. Capitalism overcame its contradiction in its own terms and by its own means and escaped the fate of revolution only by sustaining growth and the process of land and surplus value appropriation, hence the link with colonialism. And also a second aspect that Kojev incidentally fails to note by discounting externalities. This means two things. First, that in the 20th century, the collective relationship to the future is more and more defined by a secular hope carried out by technological development. A secular theodicy, if you want, that is at the same time the foundation of the political liberal order and the product of land improving and productivity extending technology or growth. And second point, this means that most institutions that have been associated with the Fordist compromise and industrial democracy are suspended to what John Rawls calls the day of reckoning. And I'm here uh, 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 borrowing from uh, a paper written by uh, uh, Stefan Eich, you have here on the slide the reference, the theodicy of growth, John Rawls, political economy, and reasonable faith. <coughs> Sorry. 
The day of, recon of reckoning means that the welfare capitalist class structure remains stable and situated within democratic norms of governance as long as the mechanisms of growth, of elite legitimacy, and justice as fairness are sustained by a never extending pioneering front of innovation, industrial development, and patterns of consumption. To put it in other words, all this holds only if the material infrastructures involved in the production of modern freedom are either well-functioning, there's growth, there's development, there is a satisfaction of secular demands, either manage to hide their externalities by moving them in space or time. Moving them in space means importing energy, exporting waste, or what some authors call ecological inequality exchange. And by moving those externalities in time, I mostly think about nuclear waste or nuclear risks. <coughs> so it, all this, only, all this post-war just social justice only works if we manage to buy time by accumulating ecological debt. Pollution and ecological damage in general, but also energy dependence, are thus not mere physical things, but fully political entities, since they are integral to the stability of a political economic system. The relevant question here is how production and protection will coexist in the 21st century, since Protection, and by protection, I mean social fairness, stability, the subordination of Darwinian war of all against all by welfare and the provision of basic needs and safety nets. So all this is premised on production. And since energy intensity comes with a massive ecological footprint, footprint it's unsustainable. The question rises of the future of this political model and what can be conceived to maintain the social ideal of collective protection in a finite world. Um, sorry. In other words, post-war welfare is the most concrete expression of what had been previously conceived by modernizers in early modern Europe the pact between the conquest of civic autonomy, we make our own history and transcend nature, and the conquest of material affluence, or again, the subordination of Darwinian conflict by protective institutions grounded in affluence. I'll come back to this later, but I want to make this point cl as clear as possible since it's crucial for me. The capture of our sense, our understanding of freedom and justice by growthmanship and productivity politics, to borrow from uh, Charles Meyer, is not just an ideological thing. By this, I mean that it's not a veil imposed on the reality of domination and exploitation, as people like Marcuse, André Gors, or Ivan Illich would say. It's not a degraded form of freedom. It's not something that strategically hides a true or primitive or authentic freedom, which would be unhindered, which would be sans entrave, as we say in French. I claim, on the contrary, that there is no other modern freedom than this one. Freedom has a material history. It has been defined, modeled, crafted, by a set of material de devices, by a set of ecological devices and practices. And until now, there is nothing beyond those historical ecological processes. The way we relate to future possibilities, both individually or collectively, to self-realization is never detached from material possibilities, from how we use land, resources, territories, how we develop knowledge, and in our case, modes of relation to nature defined by the tendency to eliminate want, to get free from the bondage of nature again. Now, saying that those infrastructures of freedom have become unsustainable comes with huge consequences, obviously. It simply means that a different sense of freedom must, must be developed on the remains of the previous one. We cannot hope to go back to some kind of 
primitive, authentic, uh, 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 pre-modern understanding of freedom. Uh, uh, but we have to build some kind of new understanding of our freedom. So it means that there is a continuity in the value we give to emancipation, and at the same time, a discontinuity in how we ground it in material supporting systems. If freedom were a trans-historical essence, it would be, I think, very easy to retrieve it from its capture by industrial capitalism, but it's not. It has been changed forever. There is some kind of irreversibility here, or uh, uh, past dependency. Energy intensive freedom has become a standard. It's an historical ecological ideal, and we are at a turning point of its history since we are facing the question of its reinvention. Now, this rather uh, 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 speculative point uh, has very concrete implication for the green left debate. Lots of people in the intellectual world and in social movements are now convinced that the climate issue is a social issue, that ecology and class structure are related, or that carbon emissions and inequalities have to be connected, not only because it's true, because they are connected, but because it helps building a large social coalition interested in decarbonizing the economy. My own work, obviously, is a byproduct of this new arrangement between the left and environmentalism, of the debate over, for example, the Green New Deal. But there are very different understandings of what this all means philosophically and politically. So that's uh, 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 the new step in my uh, argument. So here's the first uh, 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 issue I would like to develop. Uh, for some people in the green Marx universe, the climate issue and the social issue completely and ideally overlap. If we take this seriously, it means that the fight against fossil fuel companies, against, to borrow from Andreas Mann, fossil capital and its legal infrastructure, is an expression of the divide between the interest of the majority and the vested interest in status quo and climate destruction. Closing the metabolic rift, now I'm borrowing from John Foster, another prominent uh, 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 green Marxist. Closing the metabolic rift between man and nature becomes, from this point of view, the historical task of the subaltern or the working class. The argument is very easy to get and serves a very convenient bridge and serves as a convenient bridge between environmentalists and leftists, until there is no difference at all, until the green depoliticization disappears and the ecological crisis is reframed and reduced to the power of capital over the general interest. But what fossil capital sells is not only a dangerous product, it's also the pivot of our economic system. It offers jobs, it pays for social security and prosperity. It's a way of life that's deeply entrenched in an energy intensive mode of development. It's related to how we conceive our movement in space, cars, air travel. It's related to how we, we conceive our privacy. The mere fact that we have isolated windows, domestic heating, uh, 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 internet connection, energy to borrow from Stanley Jevons, 19th century, is a universal service that not only generates profit and lobbyism, but also ordinary practices and representations. And that is the reason why there actually is no perfect alignment, no perfect overlap between the interests of the majority, of the workers or the people, if you want, and the fight against fossil capital. Most people are trapped in a fossil fuel form of freedom and autonomy and they either close their eyes to the climate catastrophe because it's inconvenient, or they even sometimes actively fight against green policies, understood, understood as a source of constraint, of encumberment, or even sometimes as a freedom killer. This is what uh, 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 Mark Bliss, for example, calls the carbon coalition. You have the references 
the re reference here and the slide uh, uh, in a, 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 a paper written with Thomas Oatley. Carbon coalition is the heterogeneous social collective that holds a more or less conscious interest in sustaining the carbon economy and form of life. It's a coalition that is part white collar, part blue collar, part labor, part capital, and that has been skillfully pushed to a prominent place by conservatives in liberal democracy, the democracy most spectacularly, of course, by the US Republican Party. The fact that this coalition is fundamentally short-lived, suicidal, and absolutely unaccountable to future generations doesn't weigh much against the prosaic reality of current attachment to the fossil fuel form of life and the loyalty to fossil elite it generates. So facing the carbon coalition, there is maybe probably a post-carbon coalition made up by upper middle class, urban, educated people working in mostly intellectual professions. That's you, that's me. And some segments of popular classes, even some segments of the ruling class. This coalition is trapped between its social interests, for example, not sharing diplomas with the rest of the population, and the fact I say this because the, the, the diplomat divide is very important in the divide between carbon coalition and post-carbon coalition. And the fact that it considers itself a savior of the general interest or even a bearer of the, of the universal point of view. So this left green coalition is still shy of a democ demographic majority and even worse, it is politically condemned to inaction by its own contradictions as illustrated by the U.S. Democrat establishment. <coughs> In a way, uh, maybe I'll skip this, this, but there is uh, some historical analogies to be made between this and the, histor the historical role of the national question or by religion in the history of socialism and Marxism. But I skip this, uh, it, will, it would take me too far away from my main considerations. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, this was the, the slide uh, 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 I should have showed you before. <laughs> okay, now let's move to a second debate that is relevant for the theory and history of social protection in the 21st century, green modernism, or sometimes called eco-modernism. In conceptual terms, it's about decarbonizing the same patterns of development and political legitimacy that prevailed in the past, basically decarbonizing an energy-intensive society with growth, with labor-friendly policies, all this but with renewables instead of fossil fuels, and push for post-fossil for this compromise. So it's either this, or is it about moving away from energy intensive forms of life altogether? That's the other huge question at the heart of the climate left debate. So for decades, the climate issue remained in a dead end because no constituted political power could conceive a retreat from fossil fuels otherwise than a loss of power and domestic power on the international scene and a loss of the domestic legitimacy. When uh, George Bush Sr. said the American lifestyle is non-negotiable, it meant that fossil fuels are deeply entrenched in power structures in the balance between the risk of political delegitimation and the risk of ecological collapse always tilts on the side of those consolid consolidated interests. This status quo changed in recent years, not because the establishment became more enlightened, more aware of environment, more uh, 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 environmental friendly, but because technological advances and security issues changed the landscape. Renewables became less expensive and with them, electricity-based production systems and modes of transportation. 
military agencies at the same time redefined the climate crisis as a source of serious destabilization, both domestically and on the international stage, obviously. So the balance of interest between climate inaction and climate action started moving. Delay became a less attractive option, even for politically conservative people and investors. And for example, the leadership of, of China in the struggle for new markets, innovation and extraction pushed toward the silent revolution, the material basis of power. That is the argument of uh, 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 my piece I, I'm showing you on the slide for an ecological real politic. Uh, 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 sorry, the material basis of power might switch from fossil fuels to strategic min minerals, battery tech, microchips. In this context, the possibility of a Green New Deal appeared as a winning policy design. The complete re reinvention of productive transportation and housing infrastructures would provide jobs, growth, equality, and stability, just like fossil fuels did in the past, but without the climate risk. So this is the topic of uh, 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 the Adam Tooze piece, the debate on investment and decarbonization, and my other piece called in French, Ouvrir la Brèche, Open the Bridge. Uh, Biden uh, last year spoke about a moonshot strategy, a win-win institutional reinvention of prosperity. And in fact, it would be more than a win-win, uh, <laughs> sorry for the bad joke, a win-win-win. You win on climate, you win on jobs, and you win on the stabilization of the international order and trade rival rivalries. That is what some experts call the green swan. The sudden alignment of capital interest in decarbonation, redistrib redistributive policies and neo-Keynesian macroeconomic devices. This path of action is now, as you know, stranded in the US, but it still appears as a main viable option for contemporary progressive politics. Now, at the same time, many energy specialists and left-leaning environmentalists one, that the, the ecological footprint of renewables was heavy. Water use, chemicals, conflict between food-oriented land use and energy-oriented land use. All this raises ecological questions about the dream of a post-fossil material and political order that is premised on the continuity of the energy-intensive model, or in other terms, the Green New Deal. In more realist terms, extractive bottlenecks on lithium, on cobalt, on other strategic minerals, raise the issue of geoeconomic tensions arising from those new supply chains, or even challenged by the mere feasibility of a renewable based modern society. The debate over unequal ecological exchange resurfaced through, for example, Thierry Franco's book, Resource Radicals. Since extractive regions in the world happen to be located in economically marginalized countries in Latin America, America, Africa, local communities often refuse to pay the ecological and human price for the new Western green lifestyle while they are stuck in environmentally damaged regions with few adaptation projects. So what looks like a win-win from the perspective of the West is sometimes a double loss from the perspective of the South. It's an even and combined ecological catastrophe all over again. Even in Europe, the question arises. Recently, a lithium mine project in Serbia has been fought against by people. And those people say that they refuse to sell their mountains for cheap and greenwash the German consumer who wants to ride his electric Volkswagen. So as you can see behind the motto of electrify everything, there is a deeply political choice and a very serious reflection on what modernity is. In other words, is it possible to sustain democratic regime based on welfare, on a certain sense of material possibilities, let alone secular hopes? Is it possible to sustain the urban lifestyle that is so closely associated with modern civic freedoms without ruining the world? Some people on the left insist that the energy intensive lifestyle can be saved through energy efficiency, electricity, a better provision of energy-saving public infrastructures and renewable and sometimes 
nuclear energy. More signific significantly, they insist it's the only option we have to involve the working class in the climate fight, in, the clim in other terms, to build the post-carbon coalition, a winning post-carbon coalition, acknowledging that the left can only advance by endorsing modern, modernizing ideas. And in a way, we are back to the Ulrich Beck debate on risk society. On the other side of the divide, radical greens and degrowers insist that the planet's carrying capacity won't support this transi transition either. That a retreat from energy int intensive system is a condition to retrieve a true sense of freedom, but without really engaging with the problem of the social coalition that will demand that revolution or that transformation. Sorry, I forgot again to move my, my slides. <laughs> so here's one on the green modernization debate. Yeah, that's where I am now. Okay, so I am really close to the end now. The tension between freedom and affluence manifests itself in, soci in society under many different forms. There are at least those two debates I summarized about the overlap or lack of overlap between class interest and climate politics and the debate about the tra trajectory of modernization. All, this, all those debates reveal that the climate issue is not a matter of believe the science or the, the, the recent success movie Don't Look Up seems to indicate, but, to in, but instead an historical crisis rooted in the capture of our political condition by fossil fuels. Our lifestyles, our mode of production, our patterns of consumption, our mode of spatial, uh, uh, spatial condition, our political regimes and modes of legitimation, and of course, the in international order. All this is under the spell of fossil fuels. And it is impossible to conceive a perpetuation of the same type of social organizations under a wholly different material regime. The climate crisis is going to hurt everybody. It comes at a moment of general demobilization, depoliticization by decades of neoliberalism. And there is no guarantee that democratic system is adapted to impulse the necessary changes because it is rooted in the political stability provided by cheap energy and insensibility to risks. We are in the situation where we know we can't save everything. We have to choose only a few elements in the list. The game is, if you want, you have prosperity, private life, an encumbered movement, health, good job, the liberal order, and you can pick only three or five in this list. And even worse, we have to sell this to a majority or lose everything. So, um, my book ends with a non-conclusive reflection on how a green counter movement could emerge from the demise of the classic labor left and the dead ends of humanitarian environmentalism or catastrophism. But the crucial point here is not to try to attempt to determine by means of concepts what the future left will look like, but to gain clarity about the historical dilemmas we are facing. Ecology is indeed a social issue. It really gives ground to new forms of political conflicts and new forms of politicization. But it's mostly what we could call a wicked issue. There are many examples of the wicked politics of the Anthropocene. It is, for example, it is a failure of capitalism, but classic anti-capitalist movements are not adjusted to respond, as I showed before. It is a crisis of modernity, but we might need a modernist, a very modernist political discourse to get out of it, as I also showed. We could add that it is a failure of liberal elite, but we need scientific elites and highly coordinated social planning to get out of it, or some kind of green technocracy. One might also argue that this failure is criminal and requires a trial, but all this was completely legal. We could also add that it's about protecting people from human-induced evils, but the sense of catastrophe and doom often fuels 
the will to forget about it and enjoy what is left. So those are just a few examples of those wicked, polit the, the idea that the most important thing to highlight is the dilemmas, even before we think about a, a, a conceiving solution. So I could go on for a while with those dilemmas, but I believe most of these historical conundrums are related to the central question of how we conceive what Karl Polanyi used to call the self-protection of society in the context where productivity has to be reinvented. And that's where I will end. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. That was really uh, thought-provoking. And I dare even say a very, very Cartesian in the sense that it really provided an extremely helpful survey of the stakes uh, uh, of the debate. And um, before we discuss further, I'll, I'll hand over straight away to Corinna Mead. Yeah, thank you so much, Pierre. I learned a lot. And I don't have any contradiction in my comment to what you're analyzing and what you're saying. I think I'm just going to add more complexity because then also I don't have any way out of the dilemmas that you showed us. I mean, uh, who has might be a candidate for the Nobel Prize. So <laughs> that's uh, not where I am right now. Uh, so yeah, let me comment uh, three things. So comment on what you said about the past and the roots of modernity. So in this part, I will say something about Francis Bacon and to add another thinker. Then second, let me say something about the present and the scope of your ideas. And here I will comment a bit on the situation we are in at the moment and on the Zeitenwende. And then in the last part, yeah. I will say something about the future and the potential realization of your ideas and bring in the idea of compromise. Okay, so I start with the past and the idea of modernity. And here I will bring the thinker Francis Bacon into play because I think that we could even go one step behind what you presented us when it comes to our self-understanding and the idea of modernity and the idea of scientific progress. So the role that science itself plays in the process of modernity. And here, I think uh, Francis Bacon, so who published in the 17th century, he's quite... Uh, a thinker that shows us a lot about ourselves. So his idea was that science will improve the living conditions of all humankind. And he introduced science then after antiquity and the Middle Age in a new role. And that was based on a like crypto theological understanding of nature that man is given the mission to use and reinvent nature by God. So that's our mission. Science is understood as empirical science that is based on experiments. And you might remember those famous quotes, so that the secrets of nature are better discovered under the torture of the mechanical arts than when it proceeds in its natural course. Nature, Bacon thinks, will unveil her secrets the laws of, it, laws of its functioning under the torture of experiments. So that's the understanding of nature that's in the very, very roots of modernity. And then, so he speaks of the light bringing experiments. That's where we like under torture make then nature reveal the secrets. And then will come the fruit bringing experiments. And here he has a vision. It's really up to date. So in his Nova Atlantis, he says, well, what we are going to do is create new species, new species, cross species to get to the prolongation of life and the massive amelioration of living conditions by this. So he foresaw all of this. But of course, the understanding of nature that he has is that we are there to then change and exploit nature so that all that is given out there is just for the amelioration of the living conditions of humankind. And I think that's still our understanding. And that's still what we're using science for. And therefore, <coughs> so all the solution that we 
also are discussing in the political philosophy of climate change, so there will be a technical solution. Science will come up with something like better. Yeah, that would then still be within this model. And then one question is, well, do we have to develop a different understanding of ourselves towards nature and of the role of science then? Or can we, and I mean, that was also in your talk, trust in science that they will just find a way to make the nuclear waste dissolve or uh, that we can put it further away or that we will have some scientific innovation that uh, will solve all this crisis. Okay, then another point about Bacon is that he, of course, then assumed that these scientific innovations, they will be to the well-being of all humans, but he didn't develop any political system that takes care of the distribution of these innovations. So, for example, new medicamentation. And I think here, so when it comes to this question, well, but how will these benefits be distributed? Then we come into like the political questions. And then Marxism as well as liberalism are based on this Bacon system, on this Bacon understanding of nature. And that is so why these systems also are based on the exploitation of nature. It's just that, so I, I wouldn't only say, and that of course was your focus, that freedom is dependent on affluence. But of course the stability of other systems so that do not put freedom as their leading value, they are also based on, um, on affluence and on growth, of course. So it might be that your thesis is right, that we can't have freedom without growth, but of course we can have growth without freedom. So like in countries uh, like China, and we can have stability without freedom and with not a lot of growth like in North Korea. So I'd say, well, yeah, <laughs> it's true for us. So that freedom is based on uh, the growth, but it's also true uh, for other states that their stability is, is based on growth, even if they're not there in order um, to save freedom or to develop into freedom. Okay, so um, that was my comment on Francis Bacon and the roots of modernity in this kind of thinking and uh, a bit of skepticism. So whether science will lead us out of this, whether it's like the solution or this kind of understanding part of the problem. Okay, so now I, I jump into the present and I wanna say something about um, the scope of your ideas. So you were referring to this post-World War II order. And so in this order, I think we had a competition of two systems. So liberalism, capitalism, just in brackets, that might not be the same thing, but for the sake of the argument, so we put it in one camp. And then on the other hand, there was socialism. And then freedom has always been questioned at the time. So that there was a tension between freedom and the well-being of the whole community and a tension between freedom and equality and at least this competition of the systems. And then as we know, so um, when the wall came down and with the 1990s, so uh, someone said that this was the end of history and that liberalism won and that there was no competing system anymore. And then we started a lot to think about ourselves, but also then I remember when I started to study in the 90s, all these discussions about humanitarian interventions. So not even that it could be allowed under certain circumstances, but that there should be a duty to go somewhere and um, 
secure human rights, a duty to protect, and all these discussions that was the 90s, also in the 80s, we already had that. And that was like a kind of then thinking global very much. And also then came all that globalization in trade. And in Germany, for example, uh, the system of Wandel durch Handel, which was quite pretty much in the Kantian spirit. So he's talking of a trick of reason that we will get towards perpetual peace by then making a lot of deals with other countries. And then once we do that, we get intertwined and then we don't want to go to war so quickly. And then we had this Zeitenwende that all this concept seems not to have worked. So, I mean, people are then talking about better we still have a post-World War II order or whether a new order is coming up, new imperialism is coming up and all this kinds of stuff. And I just want to ask you, so how are you dealing with this? Because then when you're saying, well, we need to invent like some new self-understanding. Yes, I mean, I uh, as I said, I don't uh, contradict you, but... So if we want to get a grip on this climate crisis, we can't do this without all the other states. It's simply not possible. So it's not a problem that we can solve and that we talk as if it were. It's maybe uh, a leftover from this post-World War II self-understanding so that we're always in charge for world poverty, for climate change whatsoever, but maybe it's not just us. And that, of course, makes it even harder. And now comes my like last part of the comment about compromise. So obviously, we are in very, very non-ideal circumstances. Now, even more in April than in January, when we were first uh, scheduled to give the talk and comment. And then under very um, non-ideal circumstances, so very, very far away from realizing your ideal, it might be the time to change the status quo by compromise, by moving then into a direction that brings you more into the direction of your idea, but then at the expense, and that's a compromise, of sacrificing something of your idea. And that you can do, of course, inner state and inner, inner democracy and inner liberal. So between the ideas that you laid on the table, maybe compromise is possible. Uh, also then, if you have a wider scope, it might be a model that applies to the problems we're confronted with because it seems that so ideal solutions, ideal systems, well, they're not realizable at the moment. There's too much dilemmatic structure there is too much contradiction. And then if we want to move forward in any way, then compromise might be a good tool to achieve this since, uh, and that's my last remark. So alternatives to compromise, what's that? I mean, that's to keep the status quo. That's to convince the other. And that could be in the moral way. So that would be maybe the green movement or convince the other by the Biden statement. So what we can have here is win, win, win. Or you can enforce your concept on the other. But then once none of this is available, then I think you're left with compromise. So if you want to like go a slight little bit into the direction that you think is the right one. And I just want to hear your opinion on that. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Do you want to respond straight away, Pia? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you very much. All this is very interesting, very enlightening. I am learning stuff and seeing my own work on the new light. So very useful. Thank you. Uh, so first, uh, <coughs> Francis Bacon. Yes. I, I kind of regret not dealing more with uh, Bacon in, in the book because since then I, I, uh, I, I, learn new things about him and new thing that would make him even yeah more central to my own historiographical attempt and i thought it, he was and the 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 
those things uh, about uh, 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 um, Francis Bacon that are very relevant for the history I try to, 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 to write is the fact that he was not only one of the first advocates of science as a provider of, as a provider of, of a new kind of freedom, as you said, but also someone who was personally involved in the, in, in the actual concrete first attempts to reorganize at the same time, the conception of scientific authority, uh, 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 the relationship to space territory and the re relationship to time, to the future. Because Francis Bacon was associated to a group of thinkers named the Hartlib Circle in the mid 70s uh, England. And one of the persons who was very active in this circle was William Petty. So Francis Bacon had a direct influence on William Petty, the economist William Petty. And William Petty invoked the authority of Francis Bacon to draft his plan for the conquest, colonization of Ireland after the, the war between England and Ireland in the mid, in, um, after the, the Cromwell Revolution. And this document, the, the, this, uh, 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 sorry, I can't remember the name of this document. The, um, anyway, uh, 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 this attempt is very striking because it's an attempt to, to rationalize the use of Irish land by British capital owners, okay? So it was an allotment of the Irish island and the transformation of this land into a financial asset. So you see how the authority of science, the, well, the, the, the basic bricks of uh, 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 primitive accumulation and the, uh, uh, the political leg legitimacy all this gives to the imperial endeavor of England in Ireland. So you see, again, science, new relationship to space, new relationship to time. It's very organic, very, uh, 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 very synthetic uh, attempt to modernize uh, uh, society. So yes, uh, 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 Bacon is very much at the epicenter of all this uh, uh, pact between freedom and affluence. So, uh, uh, um, and the, maybe the, the key concept here is the concept of improvement. Improvement, if you read the historic, historic research by people like Paul Ward or uh, uh, Frederick Johnson, to uh, uh, British or British trained uh, historians, they show how this very concept is at the, co is at the core of those agronomic revolutions that contributed deeply to reshape even political thought because this concept of improvement, you find it in John Locke's uh, 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 second treaty of uh, civil government and in particular in chapter five on property. It's the key concept of the chapter five on property. So again, all this is uh, probably the, 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 the most crucial laboratory of the modernization process. And indeed, as you said, part of our uh, task today is to cultivate a different understanding of the achievement of technology without probably falling into the opposite uh, 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 Heideggerian, primitivist or neo-romantic conception of freedom as something that has nothing to do with technology or should have nothing to do with technology. Uh, uh, because whether you think of uh, 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 wind farms or uh, uh, solar panels or EVs or whatever, this, those are material things that reshape your sense of of yourself or yourself, the sense of otherness, of social integration, of political divide, all this. So that's it for uh, uh, Bacon. And well, the other question is uh, very interesting as well, but 
I have no other choice but to uh, tell you a bit more by the book I'm currently writing because it's an attempt to face those questions. Uh, after reading the, after re after um, writing uh, Affluence and Freedom, I realized that actually there is an, another uh, uh, normative ideal central to modern history uh, 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 besides uh, freedom, and it is peace. And I have come to believe that peace, just like freedom, has been sh constantly shaped by material development. And to be very blunt, I think that the, the international order uh, that has been shaped after World War II is completely dependent on the multiplication of productivity by fossil fuels infrastructures. Uh, again, uh, 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 Thomas Oatley uh, uh, speaks about uh, fossil peace, and I very much agree with this idea. Doesn't mean that some that uh, uh, fossil fuels bring peace. We very much know that they don't always bring peace, but there was an attempt to ground the international stability in material inter interdependency. Just think about the Robert Schuman declaration in 1950. If you want that France and Germany never come back to war, you just have to make them uh, uh, um, uh, economically interdependent and the material vehicle of this interdependency is coal and steel. That's where we are now. Again, this mix between uh, Montesquieu, du commerce, Kant, perpetual peace, and the infrastructures of coal, oil, and gas. And I think you can see me, <laughs> you can see where I'm going. Uh, uh, the current war in Ukraine is completely collapsing this attempt to build peace on fossil fuels. So why am I telling you this? Because uh, uh, have in mind the, the declaration made by your German uh, 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 minister, Robert Habeck, a few days or weeks ago, when he said that if you want to protect democracy, you have to accept some sacrifices. And that's exactly what you suggested to me. That's a big compromise. And the, the question is, uh, uh, in the name of what are we ready to make those compromises or even those sacrifices? Maybe in the name of the salvation of a form of living that is not only defined by a level of en energy use, but also by a pattern of institutional organization. And this is very much at stake with the war in, in, in Ukraine. So if you kind of raise the bar of the trade-off, and if the trade-off is democracy or heating, <laughs> domestic heating, or uh, 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 riding your car at, uh, uh, at uh, high speed on, uh, on German uh, highways, <laughs> uh, or French highways for that matter, uh, uh, maybe then you are in position to obtain the compromise you want. And I'm saying this because if, if you only think about the dilemma between uh, 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 social welfare and climate, I think you'll never get uh, uh, the, uh, the compromise. You need to raise the bar at a level of stakes that is higher and that involves the peace and war debate. So that's, it's not the reason why I'm working on this book because I, I started working on this a long time ago, but I kind of saw this new kind of conflict coming and I've been influenced by many people working on the geopolitics of energy and climate. So I think that's probably the best uh, 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 source of compromise we have now, the tragedy of history. <laughs>